Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the launch of Melanie Mitzner's Slow Reveal and Ken Harvey's Book of Casey Adair. Um, my name is Amanda Hart. I am a volunteer here at the Bureau. Um, and the Bureau of General Services Queer Division is a government agency for a government that does not exist yet. Um, the main service that the Bureau provides is to hold physical and virtual space for queer books and culture, including events like this. Um, thank you to everyone who donated online and purchased books from us. Um, through, um, through the readings, I'll be putting a link to both Melanie and Ken's books in the chat function so that you can purchase on the online store. However, we do have physical copies in the store. So if you want to check out our store, um, our, we are open Wednesday through Sunday, um, 1 through 7 p.m. So you can pick up a copy there. Um, um, I will introduce our readers and then we'll get started. Um, if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat throughout um, the reading and I will read them. Um, please stay muted throughout the event if you can. Um, and I'll be constantly monitoring the chat to make sure that I'm getting everybody's questions. Um, and we'll get started. Um, so our first reader will be Melanie Mitzner. Um, Melanie Mitzner was awarded an Edward Albee Fellowship for her play, Personal Effects. Her screenplay, Dodge and Burn, was a finalist in the Writers Guild East Foundation Fellowships. In the Name of Love and Out to Lunch were finalists in the Houston Film Festival screenwriting competition. She received a fellowship from the MET Theater and fiction grants from Vermont Studio Center and Summer Literary Seminars. An excerpt of her novel, Too Good to Be True, was published in Harrington Lesbian Quarterly. She's written for Volume One Brooklyn, Wine Spectator, Hamptons, The Groovy Mind, Society for Curious Thought, Broadcast Week, Millimeter, and Bloom. She appeared on Best of Women's Fiction podcast. You can follow her on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. For more information, visit her website, melanienitstar.com. She lives in Montreal and New York. Take it away, Melanie. Slow Reveal is set in 1990s New York, and it's about a family of artists. Uh, in an open marriage, Catherine, a film editor, meets Naomi, a lesbian poet. And after a 10-year on-off extramarital affair, Catherine's struggling to maintain both relationships. So she decides to try and reconcile her marriage with Jonathan, her husband, and deal with her two grown daughters, and an installation artist, and a writer mired in addiction. Um, I'm going to read two excerpts, so I will start with this one. Several months passed since Naomi agreed to a separation, but the months felt like years, even decades. In recent weeks, they hadn't even talked. The power of mortality was all consuming. What had not transpired, what could have been, seemed of greater importance than present circumstances. She thought of her beloved sister Deirdre in the pale light of that November morning, of her auburn hair aloft from the wind. Catch it, you dumb shit. Naomi's last words, their final exchange. One minute they were laughing, calling each other names, and the next she was lying dead in the street the tragedy of a hit and run driver. In all those years, the perpetrator wasn't caught, so she only had herself to blame. She longed for those sweltering summer nights on the screened in porch when they rocked the buzz of cicadas and crickets, listening to the far off cries of defeat at the outdoor poker tables in Burroughs Park. Now all she had left were imaginary lovers, the days when a single glance told the entire story of unrequited love back when no one was a lesbian, none she knew of in her adolescence. Few had made the distinction, at least not publicly. In those days, love was a natural state, not a categorical aspect of sexual identity. She never felt the churning, the adrenaline rush when they, when they talked about boys. She simply couldn't relate. And on too many occasions, wanted to confide in Deirdre about her interest in girls, but she knew that would amplify the distance, so she kept it to herself. Out on the street, she spotted a payphone, 
This time she rejected the notion, pushed it back into the recesses of her mind where desire sought temporary shelter while she tended to the equally pressing need for poetry, hoping to find a good reading somewhere. Food for the soul, she called it, as she perused the poetry project for signs of associative life to transcend the banality that consumed her. She wanted to lose herself, her own work having eluded her as of late. She stepped through the side door of the church where the reading was taking place and recalled her father waving her first public collection, published collection, captured for all eternity through a photograph in the Washington Journal. Through his political contacts, he managed to help with press coverage, which put her verse on the map, landing in advance for a new collection after a decade of disillusionment. Her eyes focused on the podium occupied by the radical sheep the radical left, no more than a dusty memory and the tones of Audre Lorde and Allen Ginsberg. Before her stood a cocky kid angling for attention, the poseur leaning precariously, his elbow planted on the wooden lectern. He cleared his throat, then flipped to a page where he began to read about hubris, autobiographical, no doubt. Naomi drifted off to the dark well of longing for those snowy nights in East Marion, where she paced the floor reciting her work to Catherine, who would comment with utter reassurance, convincing her there was a point to it all before she would ravish her on the living room floor as the last of the embers in the fireplace extinguished, shut out from the rest of their lives, shut down, yet gloriously open to the moment, which lingered on endlessly, as though the entirety of their existence were encapsulated in a single instant a fraction of time which normally proceeded uneventfully, unacknowledged and wholly unrecognized. Next, a woman strode up to the podium, <clears throat> her long black hair braided down her back, the mole just below her lip reminiscent of Maria Carey. In her hand, she held a book with a marker from which she read a poem about suicide, last breath written by the one who committed the act, written posthumously, written in spirit, reflecting on the state of grace she attained in the process. The very idea that someone would come back to tell about, about it dispelled the notion of the suicide victim. To dead silence, the poet closed the book and looked out over the rows of pews. The work had gripped Naomi, how to shake those suffocating words, how to dislodge them. Fresh air, oxygen, that's what she needed. It was dark outside when she reached the street, unsure in which direction to walk. She crossed Avenue A near first, spotted a phone booth and stopped. In the short space of time, she could talk herself out of the urgency. She stepped up to the receiver and slipped in the coins. Before the second ring, she realized what she experienced at the reading, the suspension of disbelief managed in the face of sudden death, Jonathan's in particular. No reason to believe the cause was anything other than a fatal hemorrhage, a victim of fate, and for that matter, hers too. Catherine answered, but at first she didn't hear Naomi's voice over the den of traffic. Who is it, she asked again. Me, I'm out on the street in the East Village. I went to a reading. Something wrong? I haven't heard from you. Not that you're under any obligation to stay in touch, but I figured we'd talk. I wanna be there for you, Katie be there in a way that might be, I don't know, beneficial. You sound like a doctor. Naomi realized how calculating she was, the way passion shape changed into need then shape changed into something more desperate, a false narrative projected onto the object of desire in the form of support, the ego masquerading as something more charitable than it could ever be. One thing she knew for sure, woman when faced with another woman could not escape the truth. I wanted to check on you. I'm all right, I guess, I don't know. Catherine's reply moved through her uncorrupted by what one or the other really wanted to hear, but that didn't last long. Okay, I'll admit it, I needed to hear your voice, Naomi told her. A long pause followed, as if there was a right thing to say and an indication she would open up. Look, I have to go, Catherine told her. She was sitting on the floor of the walk-in, surrounded by small paintings on paper. I'm making an inventory of Jonathan's work, you know, for the retrospective. Why did she have to mention him? Not knowing the details would be just fine. 
Here she was trapped by the longing, caught in the net snared, while Catherine was back in the closet comforted by a ghost, the part of Jonathan she loved and admired, the legacy he had left behind. Death was black magic, the way it clutched survivors in its grip. Death, art, suicide, all mortal acts that attained a kind of immortality through their recognition by others. Suicide, a mortal act, but the life immortalized. The dying mortal, but the death immortalized. The artist mortal, but the art immortalized. This act we call life was the very definition of mortality, immortalized through every appeal, every retreat, every confession, and every surrender. What arrogance, the very idea that Catherine's function was to serve her own, as if all relationships serve that purpose. Something was seriously wrong with that line of reasoning, passionless and bloody. Naomi didn't like the message she couldn't clean up with her deft handling of language. Could this be true? Why she viewed their relationship as immortal, as if it could never perish? Or was she busy building a security force she could hide behind, an armed one to keep out intruders, especially dead ones? Red wine, she repeated to herself, thinking she could manage that much. She looked at the sign van and block letters written across the plate glass window. Racks of French and Italian wines lined the floor to ceiling walls. She remembered an unctuous coat roti they consumed after cycling 36 miles around the fluvial terraces of the Rhone Valley, what seemed like a million summers ago. Two weeks of uninterrupted bliss, riding hard by day against the bleached out sun. Grapes glistening on the vines, that year producing a superior vintage. Basking in the eerie glow of candelabras and castles en route, where they dined in cellars and slept in medieval rooms with stone fireplaces they seldom used. Except for one particularly stormy night, the last one of their trip, when they huddled in front of a roaring fire and Catherine admitted she was missing Jonathan, that she didn't feel free of him, that he was ingrained in her like a genetic imprint. Naomi couldn't escape the image of him dropping her off at JFK, slipping a Roland Barth book in her hands, claiming to be by her side in spirit on those lonely nights ahead, having no clue of the company she would keep, let alone the lover she'd been seeing for the last six and a half years. Devastated by that confession, Naomi hoped she wouldn't hear the same lamentation recounted over a candlelit dinner, this time at her loft, that is if they were ever reunited. She was feeling possessive. If she didn't protect the relationship, no one would. Seduced by love and slaughtered by it. That's how she envisioned the outcome if she allowed herself to go that far. I have one more short excerpt to read you. <clears throat> I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Naomi tried on every jacket and every pair of pants hanging in her cramped closet. She couldn't decide which one looked best, berating herself for wanting to look that good in the first place. This wasn't a book signing. She didn't need to impress. Her indecision had nothing to do with vanity, but in some perverse way, she would replace Jonathan at his own memorial service. Attending wasn't her idea. Catherine insisted on it. She needed her there, but never explained why. From the valet box on her dresser, Naomi found the studs for the cuffs of her starch black shirt. The macabre image of funerals as weekly tributes triggered that dreadful time from the 80s. She'd been to too many over the years for friends and artists who died of cancer and AIDS. They were her peers, just like Jonathan, not her elders, as was commonly the case, except for the demise of her mother, given her rapid deterioration from early Alzheimer's. The only saving grace was her father who buffered her mother's degenerative decline by finding Devin Donovan, a doctor who treated the terminally ill without the notoriety of a Kevorkian. Death, unlike life, had become a close friend, intimate, dependable, remarkable in ways, someone she could trust, someone who reliably showed up only after a brief absence and never lacked enthusiasm for her own personal struggle. This, she said, dangling the leather harness she used to seduce Catherine, is completely inappropriate. 
Therefore, I will wear it fully accessorized. Her somber mood was broken by this crazy gesture, the inanity of it all. She imagined cutting through the crowd of mourners yelling, thou art art, pointing to the urn of Jonathan's ashes. Cruel and unbecoming, yes, but honest. Why weren't people honest anymore? Have lies been told so often they now appeared absolute and irrefutable? She dropped the briefs she planned to wear, walked out into the living room, sporting her harness, and over to the windows where she pulled up the shades and yelled, cocks and crows be damned, I stand before thee naked, a man, a woman, a monster. And she cackled and crowed maddeningly before whisking a bottle off the cabinet, lifting the cork and guzzling it down, then spraying her woolen rug with a shower of ruby wine, rubbing it in for good measure with the heel of her bare foot. Sick and tired of the tidy lies, she fixated on the stain. There will be no more deception between us. In Catherine's absence, she could not dispute her claim. The act revitalized her and her dynamism returned. She acknowledged the pulsating rhythm of her sex locked up in a harness, felt the energy bound up and turned inward. She wasn't fixed in a singular mindset about what makes a man, what makes a woman. To her, it was not the body or the genitals, but the orientation of energy, an orientation that was not absolute. She had always loved women, but knew that to love them truly, she had to love herself. It hadn't been easy, not because of her identity, but because of her disorientation around the definitions of gender, like those little icons stuck on the walls of public toilets, indicating which door to use. She rarely interpreted the symbols correctly. They made no sense to her, which accounted for the way she often walked blindly into the wrong bathroom as if there were no subtleties in the evolution of the human race. We must define, we must confine. She glanced at the clock over the kitchen stove and dashed into the bedroom to dress. If she didn't pull herself together, she'd be late for the memorial service. She wanted to be there on time, even though she knew her presence would probably make things worse. And she hated herself, the relationship for that. Thank you, that's it. Thank you so much. I will applaud for all of us. Um, <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much for reading. Um, everybody, if you want to give a little clap or a comment in the chat, go ahead. Um, but we're going to do questions at the end. So we'll move on to Ken Harvey. Um, Ken Harvey is the author of two award-winning books, a short story collection, If You Were With Me, Everything Would Be All Right, and a memoir, A Passionate Engagement. He's been published in over 20 U.S. and international literary magazines, including the Massachusetts Review, Consequence, and the Buenos Aires Review. He's read his work on national public radio in the United States and in Italy, and has been granted writing residencies at the Wurlitzer Foundation and the Malay Colony. A book reviewer from Lambda Literary, Ken holds an MFA in creative writing from Bennington College. A native of Boston, he now lives in Toronto with his husband and basset hound, Lily Tomlin. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I'll just give you a, a, a real general um, description of the book. I started writing the book about seven years ago. Um, and the book takes place in the early 80s. And it's really about the rise of fascism. And there's, there's a, a gay character, a young gay character is in Spain and he's doing theater and he witnesses the rise of fascism in Spain. And then he comes back home and he um, is in the middle of the, the AIDS epidemic. Now, I did not realize when I wrote this, this was pre-Trump, um, that a book about a pandemic and the rise of fascism would sadly be so relevant today, but there you have it. Um, I'll give you just some very quick details about what I'm going to read. Um, Spain is in the middle of a new democracy. Um, they, they've only been a democracy for le less 
less than five years. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Good Morning is the manager of the Pension. His real name is Senor Buendia, but those of you who know Spanish me, know that that is translated into Mr. Good Morning, and that's what Casey refers to him. The Pension or the um, boarding house is called Marianela. Um, and Gustavo is Casey's straight roommate. And finally, Chueca is the gay neighborhood in Madrid. The, the book is written in diary entries and letters. Um, I'm gonna read two diary entries, um, but they're back to back, so they're, they're sequential. It, um, last time I read it's under 10 minutes. So thanks for listening. Sunday, September 21st, 1980, two o'clock AM. There were only a few guys at dinner tonight. Mr. Good Morning was sitting with a man from London whose name is John, but whom everyone calls King Juan Carlos because they think he's as snooty as the king. And he is. He corrects my Spanish when it doesn't need correcting. I sat with Gustavo and a blonde guy about my age. I'd seen around but never met. He's an architecture student at the university. He looked dressed for a night out, a collarless shirt and blue and white vertical stripes, tight black jeans, black leather boots with an embossed wingtip design, sexy as hell. He introduced himself as Octavio. He'd brought a bottle of red wine that he shared to accompany our fried eggs. Dinner at Marianela is always some sort of egg. Omelets, hard boiled eggs, fried eggs, and an egg and potato salad mixed with peas called Montaña Rusa. Why Russian mountain? Maybe it's because the salad is piled very high. Dolores, an elderly lady who, with thick ankles who shuffles in her slippers, usually serves us. She always wears a gray uniform with a white collar and a torn black cardigan, even if it's warm. At dinner, Gustavo talked about a protest against Spain joining NATO on Sunday. You two should come, he said. It's not my thing, Octavio said. Gustavo waved a dismissive hand. We didn't wait all these years to get rid of Franco just to get in bed with a bunch of fucking imperialists. Spain shouldn't enter any new alliances with the United States. We need to chart our own path. I'd rather go dancing tonight and sleep late in the morning, Octavio said. You wanna go dancing, Casey? Sure, I said. Come with me tomorrow, Casey, Gustavo said, please. Although I don't completely understand the issues surrounding Spain and NATO, I was touched Gustavo invited me. It felt like a significant moment in our fledgling friendship. I can do both, I said, even though I wondered if attending a demonstration would be the sort of thing that could get me in trouble. Gustavo finished his wine and eggs and left the dining room. Now about that dancing, Octavio said, there's this new bar in Chueca, and just so you know, only men will be there my first gay bar. The only gay bar anywhere near my college was 50 miles away and I did not have a car. Dolores, who also works as a maid at the pension, wheezed as she bent over and placed and balanced our plates perfectly on her arm. I wonder if she has emphysema. When she left, Octavio told me she was pretty deaf. I asked Octavio why she was working at her age. He said she lived in the basement room of the pension for free, and if it weren't for Marianela, she'd be out on the street. I ran upstairs to change into a pair of clean, clean blue jeans and, in, in an attempt to play the mysterious foreigner, a nearing college t-shirt. My loafers were no match for, Gustavo, uh, for uh, Octavio's boots, but they were better than sneakers. The metro was packed. Everyone was looking out after dinner. As we got closer to the Chueca shop stop, I looked at the male passengers, wondering if any of them would be going where we were. A few of them did get off with us, and one of them followed us to a bar called Black and White on the ground floor of a stone building. In keeping with the name of the bar, the walls were black and the furniture white. Octavio ordered and I ordered beers, then sat at one of the small white tables. I watched the men some with their arms around each other, others kissing, and let myself feel at home. Although the name of the bar was black and white, I felt like I'd just left a world of black and white and was now seeing in color for the first time. 
I didn't look like most of the men, all muscly in their tight tank tops, and hardly anyone was wearing a belt. I excused myself and went into the men's room. I knew I couldn't change looking like a scrawny boy in front of these men, but I could at least look like I had some fashion sense. I unbuckled my belt and put it on the top of the toilet tank mounted high on the wall. Octavio appeared just as I exited the stall and led me to the dance floor. A silver disco ball spun from the ceiling while a DJ and cutoffs played records. The room was big enough to fit about 100 guys, some shirtless, revealing torsos so perfect it was hard to believe they were real. The sweat on their chests looked like it had been applied with a spray bottle. We must have danced half an hour before Octavio signaled us to go back upstairs. He said he had to leave and that he wasn't returning to the boarding house. I didn't ask why. He walked me to the metro and went on his way. I'm back at Marinella. I'm exhausted, but there's no way I can miss Gustavo's demonstration tomorrow. I'm trying not to think about where Octavio is right now. Monday, September 22nd, 1980, 1.30 a.m. I only slept about three hours last night before the NATO demonstration, so I was in a daze following Gustavo through the Moncloa district to a university basement office. About 30 people, mostly students, were making signs not just against Maine's participation in NATO and the increase in U.S. naval base, military bases in Spain that would follow, but also in support of improved working conditions for the miners in Asturias and Galicia. At the end of the room, Galician musicians warmed up their flutes and bagpipes and drums. I leaned against the wall, feeling like a parishioner who didn't know the words to the opening hymn. Gustavo thrust a stack of poster board into my arms and told me to write, Yankees go home in red, white, and blue. I knew it was the US military that Gustavo wanted to leave, but I couldn't help but think that the word Yankees included me. I started writing while Gustavo dashed from table to table, checking the signs, instructing the protester to underline a word or make the letters better, thicker. After a while, he whistled through his fingers, unfolded a large hand-drawn drawn map of Moncloa and thumbtacked it to the wall. With a red magic marker, he highlighted the route of the march. From the university, we'd pick up at Calle de la Princesa, a few blocks away, then head straight to the Plaza de España and gather in front of the statue of Cervantes. He announced that there were about 200 people outside, a pretty good crowd considering this was the first march opposing Spain's entry into NATO. We followed Gustavo to the street and distributed the signs. Everyone was chanting and waving their flags. That's when I started to wake up. Wake up and wonder what the fuck I was doing here. I was sent here to study theater, not protest the Spanish government. The, the agreement I signed with the foundation must have included a clause about not making political trouble. What if I got arrested? I wanted to be back at black and white dancing with Octavio. Gustavo ran up the steps of the university building and cheered us on through the, a megaphone. He waved for five protesters in the front to join him. They unfolded a long white sheet that read, bases out as well as war, which makes more sense in Spanish because it rhymes, bases afuera, así como la guerra. Gustavo encouraged us to yell the slogan, cupping our mouths with both hands. At first, the march to Plaza de España was more like a celebration. People gathered on their balconies and waved and clapped Others joined us as we walked. At the end of the line, the Galician, Galician musicians played what sounded like Irish folk songs. Some protesters jumped out of the procession to dance. Cars piled up, <clears throat> started piling up in back of us. Drivers honked. We were louder than the horns for a while, but as the traffic grew, the horns drowned us out. The municipal police arrived in black helmets brandishing clubs and carrying body length plastic shields, making them look more like robots than humans. As the chanting switched from rhyming slogans to angry declarations of NATO, no, the demonstrators became a mob. I tried to thread my way to the sidewalk, but the mob was closing in. I pushed as hard as I could to get off the street. 
One woman fell into the arms of another woman. Someone elbowed me in the stomach. It wasn't strength that kept me pushing, it was panic. I stumbled onto the sidewalk just in time to see Gustavo, blood dripping down the side of his face, pushed to the ground by two cops. They handcuffed him behind his back and pulled him up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'll be your audience with all the clapping. I'm sure everyone is just clapping so much at their own home. Um, but beautiful, beautiful job, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, so anyone is welcome to put chats, um, questions in the chat. Um, I will be um, giving the questions and I'll try to keep on the chat so that I can see if you guys are asking anything. Um, so we will start. Um, I would love to hear about, so Melanie, your book is set mm -hmm. in the early 1990s. Um, Ken, yours is set in the early 1980s. So um, why did you choose to set your novels in these periods? And what were some of the challenges in research and just in general about setting a novel in a time that isn't now? <laughs> um, well, you know, I was living in New York from 79 to the early 90s. And um, I really grew up there, you know, physically, spiritually, creatively, um, you know, I had a love affair with New York. So that was the setting. Um, the 90s was a very transitional time to me. I, I felt like, um, you know, that's when gentrification on steroids was really decimating neighborhoods. And, you know, a lot of creatives, chefs, entrepreneurs, you know, the little stores in the East Village and down in Tribeca, which was like no man's land before, um, turned into you know, big box Kmarts and, and the rents were astronomical and it pushed everybody out. I mean, little galleries that, that could survive without being associated with institutions. So, you know, the novel itself symbolically is all about transition. And so I thought that placing it there, you know, at that time was appropriate. Um, since I lived there, you know, it wasn't as much of a challenge if I hadn't lived there, um, but that's that's why I placed it then. Um, I mine is in the early '80s, and I placed it there because I knew I wanted to write about um, the coup attempt in Spain because I was there when that happened, and I knew I also wanted to write about AIDS, and um, so that was pretty easy to decide. Um, what was hard for me. I think whenever you're setting in period, I think it's very, you have to be very careful that you don't sound like you're educating your reader, that, that the details of the period are fully integrated into the story. And it doesn't read like some sort of um, summary of what the 1980s were like. Um, that was, what, what was also very hard is um, the second part of the book takes place in 1984 and 1985. And that's when Casey, who has learned um, how to, he learns from Gustavo how to resist and how to protest. And he brings that knowledge to um, the, the fight for AIDS funding. Um, what was really hard, especially since I was writing it in journal form and letter form, I had to go back and really find out exactly when they started take, they were able to test for HIV. And I had to find all the details as to when AZT was was uh, you know was available, and and I had to do it almost by the month because I was writing um, you know month by month or day by day in a in a in a in a journal. Um, the the easy part for me about setting um, the the story in the early '80s was that cell phones have really made plotting fiction hard because. You know, when you think of Jane Austen or you think of, you know, think of the past, weeks would go by before people, people's letters would cross and anything could happen. Now you just have to pick up a cell phone. And, it's, and so in terms of plotting, 
it was much, it was hard in one way because I, I had a big map, a chart with all the dates of the letters and the journals, but people couldn't get in touch with each other that quickly. And that is a really fertile ground um, for fiction. I, I, technology in general has sort of changed, I think, fiction. Um, if you remember the, the movie, The Favorite, um, when uh, Olivia Coleman at one point, she takes a letter from her lover and she, she, she throws it into the fire and it burns. You know, now we'd press the delete button and that's just not as dramatic. I mean, it just, it, it just isn't the same thing. <clears throat> Great. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to adapt. Um, Juliana has a question. Um, so in both of your novels, we see the story from perspectives of a number of different characters. Um, I'd love to hear why you did this and also what were the challenges that you faced when writing that way? Well, um, you know, in, in the case of um, Slow Reveal, you know, one person's life experience is very different from another, even when you live in the same household and, and go through the same thing. And I really wanted to, um, I mean, intimacy is, is a focal point in this novel. And I really wanted to explore those different points of view um, and how it allows for a more intimate connection than a first person singular or a third person narrator. Um, and I felt like it also allowed me to do a deeper exploration from a psychological standpoint, if I could use multiple characters. Um, you know, the baggage of family history, the generational trauma, or what I call emotional heredity, um, it's portrayed from different characters' perspectives. And I really, you know, that was something that I really wanted to do in this work. So um, I know it's kind of frowned upon to do different points of view and it's not conventional, but I said, oh, the hell with it. Um, and, <laughs> and the, you know, it's the same thing with, um, with art, you know, the process that, the artistic process that people go through. And, and I feel that um, I do a lot of uh, parallel work with, the artistic process and building intimacy and trust and love because it really kind of requires similar things like, um, you know, how we sabotage what we want most and it exposes our insecurities and our vulnerabilities and our limitations. And so I wanted each character, you know, their different take on their relationships and also on art because there's a lot of artists in the world. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, once I decided to, um, write the book in terms of letters and journal entries. I mean, I had to, I had to include multiple perspectives. I mean, there are about five or six people who exchange letters um, throughout, throughout the book. Um, I, you know, and I, and I did that because I, I wanted to give a sense of eavesdropping on these lives. Um, and somehow like reading people's letters feels like you're, you're, you're eaves, eavesdropping a bit. Um, what was challenging was because I was writing letters from different points of view, I had to be really clear about how these people articulated the, um, the world. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to make sure that if you picked up a paragraph of any letter in the book, you would know right away who it was from because of the way they speak, what they're talking about. Um, and and that, was, that was a challenge because you don't wanna go overboard, but you do want, or I did want to have some, you know, very distinct voices. Awesome. And this is a question just for Ken. Um, Martha in the chat was hoping for you, we talked a little bit about setting the novel um, in the past, but how was the research process um, for your book? How did that go for you? Yeah. First of all, thank you for coming, Martha. Um, you know, I, it's tricky because I lived in Spain during the coup attempt. Um, and so, but that was 40 years ago. Um, and so the first, I actually don't do my research first. I do it afterwards after I do a draft and I called on my memory um, and I didn't keep a journal while I was there, I called on my memory to create 
you know, 1980, 1981, which was an astonishing year um, to be abroad. Uh, John Lennon was shot, Reagan was elected, the Pope was shot. Um, I mean, there were, there were just one thing after another happened and to see that, oh, and the hostages were released, um, the, the, the Iran hostages. So it was a really amazing time uh, to be. But um, so I first, I, ju I just wrote it and then I read through and I thought, okay, where, where, um, where does this need more detail to me to be believable? And so I actually went back to some old newspapers, there's a, a El País is a, um, a really progressive newspaper in, in Spain. I went back to some of those online. Um, I, I, read an, I, I read a number of um, sort of historical books about the coup attempt, um, but, but I, I tend to write first and fill in the gaps later. Um, yeah. Awesome. So this next question is from Melanie. Um, so this is from Andreas. Um, the book seems to be filled with insights and reflections from the characters. I would imagine that some or many of these things you yourself had, but is there something new or surprising that you learned or discovered about yourself or human nature while writing the book? Oh, well, <laughs> um, you know, it's not, you know, literally my life experience at all. I mean, I don't have children. I didn't have a 10 year affair. You know, there's a lot of things that aren't uh, my life. But yes, I always learn so much about myself and, you know, how I think and, and how I feel through the writing process. I, I think that's, that's part of the joy of, of doing it. Um, so yes, uh, but, you know, as far as, you know, what, it, this kind of relates to something that I think I may be asked later, but um, I, it, I did, um, I was married and I, um, but I had, I was in a long relationship and I had a, a strictly platonic relationship with my best art friend for many years, who was also in a relationship. And then one, um, night I found myself in a restaurant on the wrong side of the table and it's that was 27 years ago so um you know that's that 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 part might you know relate to my life experience but no it wasn't an on-off 10-year affair um and I did you know I learned a lot about you know I thought a lot about I, I, I think always think a lot about family dynamics and family dysfunction. It's something I'm a little obsessed about in my writing and, and, and pretty much in almost everything I write because I'm fascinated by it. I mean, we're, we're it's, you know, I mean, we're, it's the nuclear family is a, an enigma that we'll never be able to figure out. And it, 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 it influences the trajectory of our lives. You know, it's a very major thing. So um, yes, I, I, that was a lot of what I focused on in the novel. Great, yeah, and I'd love to tie in. Um, this is this is a bit of a question I was going to ask. So um, Ken, feel free to answer. Melanie, feel free to add to what you already said. But um, how did you draw on your own life to write the novel? Obviously, Ken, you talked about. Um, how most of it was your own experience. Um, so why don't, yeah. why don't you talk about that? The, the sort of structure of the novel is very much indicative of my life. I mean, I lived in Spain, I returned to Boston and, and then moved to Toronto. And that's sort of the trajectory of Casey. Um, I didn't have half, I didn't have, I did not have the exciting youth that Casey had. I wish I had, but maybe it was some sort of a fantasy. I don't know. Um, but, you know, the details, the, the sort of historical details were very real to me, the, the coup attempt. Um, I, you know, I, I, I remember very clearly um, a friend of mine uh, had AIDS and he died in 1984, which was really early. Um, really, really early. So I drew on, I drew on that, but I did have to, it sort of relates to the last question, I did have to fill in. I read a lot of journals um, and diaries 
uh, about the AIDS epidemic. I I had I reread things like and the band played on. Um, I uh, um, Sarah Shulman's amazing book Let the Record Show just came out a few months ago. I certainly uh, would have benefited from that. Um, but but I, and I certainly didn't. Um, I don't really base my characters on other people. I, I'll find a, a weird detail. I'm much more likely to base a character on, I don't know, the cab driver that picks me up to go to the airport tomorrow. Because I don't, because he's a mystery or she's a mystery. You know, that they're a mystery. Um, you know, people close to me aren't mysteries really. And the, the interesting part for me is um, finding out what that mystery is and figuring it out. Great. Now, um, we have a question from Harlan, um, from Melanie. Um, what's the difference in writing scripts and novels and which do you prefer? Well, there, there is a really big difference because, um, you know, writing scripts, you, you're just basically giving directions and, and, you know, being, you know, it's a visual um, craft. Whereas, you know, writing prose is very different. Um, I, I can't say I like one over the other. I, what I struggled with with screenwriting, because I really loved it, was the collaborative part. <laughs> collaborating. Um, it's not that I didn't want to collaborate, but I ran into some situations where ridiculous things were asked of me to change, you know, a screenplay. And I, I was so horrified by it. I was pretty naive at the time, but I was pretty, I was very horrified. But like, for instance, I had a screenplay. It was a black comedy about uh, a chef whose wife is a vet and she dies of bad hotel chicken at a veterinarian convention and the kid develops these food phobias, you know, and the husband's like a chef. And they didn't want the vet, the wife to die, you know? So I'm like, I don't think I can do this, you know? And so, so things like that kind of drove me in another direction. And also the fact that if you really wanted to be a screenwriter, I felt you had to be in LA and I was still in New York and, and stayed in New York. so that redirected me. Um, but yeah, well, there's a lot of differences in, in writing scripts and novels, but I, you know, I, I, um, I, sometimes I'm very visual in my novels and I feel that that's um, an aspect of, to the, you know, somewhat cinematic in, in the way that I write prose and, and fiction. Okay, great, um, moving on. Um, Melanie, um, your novel is structured in a fairly short section that defy the word chapter. And Ken, your novel is structured in letters and journal entries. Um, why don't you speak about why you decided to tell the story that way and give some insight into that? Um, basically, I felt that, I mean, I actually have a tendency to write, if you can call them chapters, short chapters. It's just, I don't know, it's just some aspect of my writing. But particularly for this novel, I felt it was appropriate because I was changing points of view all the time. Um, and I, I felt that it was clearer, you know, that the, the, the reader could follow it more easily um, if I was doing those switching like that. Um, and there are some areas that you'll, you might get a little confused, but um, yeah, I just thought it was appropriate to write very short chapters for this. Yeah, and for me, the, the sort of um, basic answer is it just sort of came to me that way. But it came to me that way because when I look back on my time in Spain, what I remember is letters. That's how I communicated home. Um, telephone calls were unbelievably expensive. Um, you know, it, when, when a, a, a public telephone would break, in Madrid, they'd have these things called duro drops, where you'd put a nickel in and you could talk forever. And there'd be a line of people, you know, just lined up because they were just way too, um, way too expensive. So, so that was, was one reason. And the other reason, I, you know, I talked about eavesdropping, but um, I wanted, I wanted the sense of some sort of historical document 
Um, and what happened ended up happening was um, at first the book was just diary um, uh, entries and letters. And then my agent said, why stop there? You know, why not go further? And so I did. I, um, I ended up putting, for example, a copy of the King's Speech, the night of the coup attempt. Um, Casey ends up being a director and he directs two Shakespearean plays. I end up putting the programs in there because each program has a director's note. So you actually learn something from Casey. Um, so I, 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 and that's why, and that's why it's called the book of Casey Adair. Um, I, I did want to have some sort of a documentary feel to it. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's always really, really interesting to see. Um, but I'd also love to hear about your guys's writing lives. Like, how do you balance other obligations with your writing? And do you have specific structured writing periods? Or do you just wait for inspiration to hit? Well, if you're going to wait for inspiration to hit, it's kind of like social justice. You have to fight for it. You know? <laughs> forget, forget the inspiration part. Um, I mean, and, and of course, read and do everything that, that does inspire you, you know, other people's work and art forms. Um, but um, I, yeah, I, I'm pretty, except for promoting books and doing, you know, which is like completely consuming and crazy. Um, I'm pretty regular about it. I, I usually write very early in the morning uh, before anybody's up. <laughs> um, and, um, but I do have to, I've always had to support myself and my writings never supported me. So I've always had to hold down a job while I'm, you know, right, I'm writing. But um, I did have some years where I had a gig uh, with a California client. So my, my whole morning was free, um, which was really great. But then when um, my partner's parents' health was declining and we, we moved to Montreal to care for them, um, we made an executive decision that we were gonna put our art lives first. And we rented our house to cover the expenses and lived in a pretty Spartan apartment for 12 years. Um, and a, you know, a, a very simple life and spent much more time on our art lives um, mm -hmm. until you know, things started to change. And um, so anyway, yeah, generally that's, that's how I'm, my writing life has gone. My, my lighting right, life has sort of changed over the years. Um, my husband and I raised two children who are now in their 20s and early 30s. So, but when they were younger, um, life, and I was teaching um, middle school at the time, um, things were a lot more hectic. And so I would actually write from 1030 at night to 1130 at night. Um, that was the only time I could find. Um, I try hard to have um, a schedule and I, uh, like Melanie, I, I, I write in the morning and like Melanie, if I ever just waited for inspiration, <laughs> forget it. I mean, just forget it. I, I often, um, I also have uh, in Toronto, there's this place called the uh, Toronto's, Toronto Writers Center and I have a desk there and um, it's open 24 seven. And there's a, when you go into the room, there's a, there's sort of a living room and then a room. You can't even sneeze in there. I mean, you, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't do anything, anything that would create noise. If I really need to do something, if I've got a deadline, that's, that's where I'll go. But I, generally speaking, I try, when I sit down, I, I, I try, try to write 500 words a, a, a day. And if it goes over, that's fine too. But I also find that if I leave the novel in the middle of a scene, just as I feel like I want to keep writing more and more and more, that's really a great place to stop because the next morning, you, you know, know where to, to start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's yeah. just sort of a trick that I think writers have. I think that's great advice. There's been many times where I've sat down to write and just Nothing. So yeah. well, beautiful. That too. <laughs> well, also, also remember, you know, um, 
taking away 500 words is as productive as adding 500 words. In. <laughs> I, I cut 80 pages from this novel. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I would love to hear how, how you pare down your novel. Um, what do you, uh, especially tackling such complex topics, like what, what, it, what gets on the cutting board? Hmm. Well, I'm, I, I'm an, a, a relentless editor, you know, I, I edit when I'm doing a reading, I'm, you know, I, I edit when I'm, you know, I never stop editing. Um, but that's the way I write. Some people, you know, they do it all in their head. You know, my father was like that. He wouldn't, he could figure everything out in his head and then the first draft would be perfect. I'm like laborious about that. I, you know, a million drafts and, and, and you know, they always say, well, you know, you got to edit a certain way. You know, you do a line edit or you do, you know, edits on characters, you do edits on plot or whatever, but I'm, I'm kind of a messy editor that way. I don't, I don't know if I'm really organized that way. What about you, Ken? I, um, I, I find that I need some distance between the writing and the editing because I really need to be ruthless. Um, I cut two major characters out of Casey Adair and nobody has said, gee, where are those characters? Um, they're, they're, just, they're just not <laughs> missed. I, in, in a very basic level, I, I try to distance myself and say, okay, if I'm a reader, where am I going to lose interest? And I'm ruthless about that. And, and if it doesn't contribute to, like, I think the theme of the book is, I like to call it our universe of obligation. How do you, how do you, you know, protest and work for social justice and raise a family and have a career? Um, how it, so every, everything in the book, I think, ties into that. Um, you know, and what exactly is political activism? At one point, Casey um, stops protesting because his lover is dying uh, of AIDS. And so he said, you know, this is activism. You know, this is what I'm doing is just as important as getting arrested. But yeah, I, you just have to be ruthless, I think. Yeah. All right, we have a question from Jen um, for Ken. Um, she says, I fall in love with every character. Do you think anyone might come back in another book someday? <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Casey, um, Casey takes place from 1980 to 1984. And my original um, idea was for it to have another section during the Trump years. And I realized actually I'd said pretty much everything I needed to say about the Trump years in the 1980 to 1984 section. Um, if a character were to come back, I, I suppose it would be Casey. Um, people have asked, um, but, you know, I, I, I didn't tie up all the ends at the end of the, in the novel because I just don't, I, I really appreciate writing that leaves a little ambiguity. Um, so I, I would say, you know, it, I'm working on another novel now, but we'll see after this novel whether Casey, Casey will return. Yeah. It'll Great. be the podcast of Casey Adair. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, probably a final question, unless anybody else has a, another question, um, put it in the chat. This is your last chance. Um, <laughs> would you guys be willing to talk about the title of your novels? How did you decide what to call your books? And what were you trying to communicate? How did you want to grab your readers? Well, you know, here, here is the dovetailing of screenwriting and, and, and fiction. Slow reveal, you know, to me, it's, it's really more of a cinematic term, you know, and, and um, the, the, the shot, the reveal shot. And, and I, I, since the main character is a film editor, I thought that was appropriate. But I also decided that that is the way truth reveals itself. You know, we always know the truth. We just can't accept it, you know, so it's very slow um, in its evolution. So I felt that, um, you know, being able to acknowledge the truth um, and recognize it, uh, that slow reveal was, 
was the right title for it. Yeah, I'm horrible at titles. Um, I really, the title for me is the last thing to, to come to mind, although strangely enough, the novel I'm working on now, the title came first, but that's the only time that's ever happened. And, and this book probably had no fewer than 15 titles. Um, <laughs> I, I finally settled on Casey Adair and my agent said, uh, you know, um, that's just sort of boring. And, you know, they don't know who Casey Adair is. And, and he was the one actually said, what about the book of Casey Adair? And once he said it, I thought, yeah, that, 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 that makes it a little more interesting. Um, so, so yeah, and, and the, 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 the phrase, the book of, that ended up really uh, addressing the whole structure of the book through documents and through letters and through journals. Um, it is a book in a way. It's a book, it's a novel and it's a book at the same time. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, this has been really exciting and insightful. Um, thank you guys for reading and for answering questions. Um, if nobody else has any more questions, then I would just ask that everybody go visit the links, buy the books. They're obviously incredible, so please do. Um, and feel free to stick around for a couple of minutes after the event um, and give your praises to the authors. But um, thank you guys so much for coming and be sure to visit the Bureau Wednesday through Sunday, one through seven. So thank you guys so, 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 so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, really, we appreciate it.